Well, I'm very happy to be here. And as Father Rock said, I like to see all these young, smiling faces here. Um, gives old guys hope. Uh, and also, I want to thank Father Antonio and Dave for inviting me to be part of this conference. Um, I can't, I can't, my Mesopotamian knowledge is, you know, <laughs> is really, uh, so, so I'm, I'm just going to try to uh, give some reflections of a historical theologian. And in that connection, I have to mention Glenn Olson. And I, I really miss Glenn because when I have to walk in the company of the metaphysicians, I always like to have Glenn by my side, <laughs> you know, just to, to kind of help. Okay, so to start out, back in November, I had a traumatic experience. I won't share it with you, but I will tell you that it had to do with Catholic theologians and the incredible things that they might be inclined to say. And this set me off to seek guidance and light and consolation from reading Cardinal de Lubac on the Council and on its aftermath. So this afternoon, I want to look at the Council on the theme of holiness in the world, especially in Gaudium et Spes, through the eyes of Cardinal de Lubac. To our consideration of the Council, he adds the pathos of a faithful and heroic life. In 1985, Father Angelo Scola interviewed de Lubac for the Italian journal 30 Days. And de Lubac was going on about how people really didn't know what the council said. And Scola sort of threw him a softball and said, do you really think that people don't know uh, Lumen Gentium? Were, were they really, was it really that badly known? And so de Lubac answered and said, uh, you know, I challenge you to go out and ask all your Catholic friends what Lumen Gentium refers to. And most of them will say that it refers to the church. And what it really refers to, of course, is Christ. Um, de Lubac's post-conciliar emphasis on the Council's seemingly obvious Christological center will be my focus. It is this Christological focus which enables us to keep the world awake to God conveying the sense craved by contemporaries and by all my students that God is real. So the main point is that whatever light the council sheds on contemporary affairs, it draws from Christ. As de Lubac said with reference to Lumen Gentium in 1967, what in other circumstances might appear banal and conformist will today perhaps appear in another light. So the first part is de Lubac's contributions to the Council. De Lubac's authority as an interpreter of the Council rests on significant contributions he made both long before as well as during its sessions. Let us, he wrote in Catholicism in 1938, abide by the outlook of the Fathers. In 1941, with Jean Daniel Lou, he founded the series Source Chrétienne, which along with his books Corpus Mysticum and Surnaturel, put him at the center of the movement for renewal through return to the sources known in France as ressourcement. Many other scholars in biblical, liturgical, and theological studies contributed to this movement. But by the time of the council, de Lubac, along with his Dominican counterpart, Yves Congar, had emerged as the public face of ressourcement. The council's momentous decision to avoid the style of textbook theology and speak instead the vital language of scripture and the church fathers reflects, excuse me, reflects the perspective of de Lubac and ressourcement. The impact of de Lubac's perspective is clear in what is arguably the council's central document, Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church. Chapter one of the proposed schema on the church had been titled, The Nature of the Church. In its final form, chapter one is called The Mystery of the Church, also the title of the first chapter of de Lubac's 1954, The Splendor of the Church. Just as the final chapter of Lumen Gentium, that book's final chapter is called The Church and Our Lady. As noted above, 
after the Council de Lubac found it necessary to point out on many occasions that the Lumen Gentium of the Constitution's Latin title was not the Church, but Christ. Dei Verbum, he likewise insisted, is not in the first place a document about the Bible. The Word of God, the one full source of divine revelation as communicated through Scripture and the tradition of the Church, is Christ. De Lubach's own hand is most clearly visible in Gaudium et Spes. This pastoral constitution is divided into two parts. The first and theologically most important, chapters 1 through 4, paragraphs 1 through 45, offers a Christologically based understanding of human life and destiny. The second part, chapters 1 through 5, paragraphs 46 to 93, deals with some urgent problems of contemporary life. The relationship between these two parts is the key to the theme of holiness in the world. It's also a sort of analogate for everything that, that we're talking about. So, the, you know, nature and grace, God and the world, the first part of Gaudium et Spes, the second part. Are they related or are they juxtaposed? How are they related? Uh, in his 1989 memoir, de Lubach describes working side by side with Bishop Ochiwa at the time of the arduous birth of the famous Schema 13, which would become Gaudium et Spes. In 1944, he had published the drama of atheist humanism. Paragraphs 18 through 22 of Gaudium et Spes, which deal with the church and modern atheism, clearly show that they were inspired by de Lubac, down to the formulation of individual sentences. One of the best known of these sentences, especially to people in this room, <laughs> comes from the heart of the first part's Christological anthropology at paragraph 22. It is Christ, the last Adam, who fully discloses humankind to itself and unfolds its noble calling by revealing the mystery of the Father and the Father's love. Dulubach after the council. It has been said that after the council, Dulubach became a conservative. This is really bad. <laughs> For his part, he regarded progressive and conservative as descriptive of what he called two types of human temperaments, both equally honorable and whose cooperation can even be precious, the union of boldness and prudence. But as political labels, he insisted, or he, I'm sorry, he dismissed them as completely inappropriate to the council. Given the council's Christological center as the Lubach understood it, his attitudes after the council appear consistent with the theological path he followed throughout his life. The appendices to Dulubach's memoir show that already during the council's sessions, especially at the time of his work on Gaudium et Spes, he had reservations about the directions in which some theologians wanted to take the council. In November 1965, he, he resigned from the editorial board of the journal Concilium, having observed that the orientation of the review did not correspond to what its title had led him to expect. Like his younger colleague and Tubigen, Joseph Ratzinger, de Lubac was frightened by the student riots of spring 1968 in France. Using the word Durkheim applied to the French Revolution, he described them as a kind of effervescence of the student world that spread almost over the whole country and which was, this is very understated, extremely questionable. <laughs> <laughs> they were called to him the fate of Christian humanist calls for reform during the 16th century that ended in the Reformation's ecclesial devastation and excess of newness. In December 1968, a group of Catholic theologians connected with Concilium published a declaration on the liberty and function of theologians in the church, along with Rahner, Kuhn, and Skillebakes, Congar, Chenu, Kasper, and Ratzinger also signed it. De Lubac refused, as did Jean Danielou and Henri Bouillard. 
Eventually, he joined efforts by Ratzinger, Baltazar, and others to found Communio. He helped to launch the French language edition and served for two years at, on its editorial committee. At its 1969 commencement, St. Louis University gave de Lubac an honorary degree. This occasioned his address, The Church in Crisis. Though he insisted that because of the promises of Christ, his words should not be interpreted as pessimism, he spoke of decomposition and disintegration in the church. What were de Lubac's substantive theological objections to new theological orientations in, in the church after the council? To put it simply, he saw being reenacted and reinscribed in a new way in the church the separation between faith and life in the world that he had long struggled to overcome. Since the French separation laws of 1905, for socially conscious French Catholic thinkers such as Maurice Blondel and de Lubac, the word separation, this is a powerful word for a French man of de Lubac's generation, the word separation carried a powerful negative valence. The Napoleonic Concordat had at least recognized Catholicism as the religion of the majority of Frenchmen. The separation laws abrogated the Concordat and wrote into the civil law of the church's eldest daughter a hostile legal version of the separation between faith and life de Lubac had long attributed to modern theology. To put it more specifically, and in terms of the council itself, de Lubac saw the Christological anthropology of part one of Gaudium et Spes being separated from the concerns of part two about the urgent problems of the world. The world of part two swallowed up in a new secularization, part one's Christ-centered interior life in the church. Even during the council, he feared that Gaudium et Spes was being taken as the expression of what he called an inferiority complex with respect to the world and a sign of the times, the Catholic church beginning to doubt her mission of eternity. He visited the United States in 1969. His talks emphasized the need for an energetic revival of faith. The first condition for writing the church's course was the love of Jesus Christ. He saw the love of Jesus under attack, dismissed as passé, as passé, I'm sorry. The real Jesus of history was not available to us. We are separated from the faith of the ancient councils by vast differences of time and culture. From a psychological point of view, devotion to the person of Jesus is derided as sentimental and unworthy of mature adults. Among religious, he found in many cases resentment towards the interior life, abandonment of discipline, and the most negative of all the critiques leveled against the church, its institutions, and its leaders. For many, he wrote, the person of Jesus is effaced. A mind filled with the Holy Spirit is a mind open to the future, he told a group of Benedictine sisters in Connecticut in 1969. And at the same time, at the same time, this Holy Spirit can never lead us beyond Christ. Such remarks could be dismissed as the exaggerations of a bitterly disappointed old man whose time had passed. But de Lubac never lost hope for the council. He reminded the Connecticut Benedictines in 1969 that implementing the Council of Trent in France had taken a whole century. As late as 1980, in Appendix B of a brief catechesis on nature and grace, de Lubac published a substantive theological account of this displacement of Christ that he had decried rhetorically in his 1969 talks. He describes this piece as an analysis of an expression dear to Father Skilbakes on the church as the sacrament of the world, an expression he, Skilbakes, in, uh, attributes incorrectly to the last council and one that he invokes in favor of a process of secularization. After establishing that the council doesn't call the church the sacrament of the world, de Lubac surveys various possible meanings the phrase could have, as well as Skilobake's hopes for schema 13. 
He concludes that the council, especially in part one of Gaudium et Spes, rejected sacrament of the world in Skillbake's sense. This is a long argument, but at stake is the centrality of Christ and whether Christ is indeed the prime analogate, as it were, for a sacramental or incarnational understanding of the world. How should we understand the sense in which the world is graced? In Susan Wood's summary, at issue between Dulubach and Skillbakes, is how grace is present in the world, within the temporal order by creation or through the Christ event mediated through the church sacramentally. I wouldn't want to juxtapose those in a dualistic manner, but on the other hand, I wouldn't want to drop Christ out either. Um, one has only to read Skillebeck's two formidable volumes, Jesus and Christ, as well as his sermons, to know that the figure of Jesus Christ loomed at the heart of his theology and his piety. Nevertheless, in this appendix on the sacrament of the world, Dulubach puts his finger on a major tendency in Skillebeck's thought, especially in the late 1960s, but also subsequently. Though explicit secularization theology happily died long ago, a certain tendency to displace Christ, sometimes in favor of history or the cosmos, remains strong in a contemporary Catholic theology that I encountered in November, often uncomfortable with the central role in the cosmos and history attributed to Christ in the first four chapters of Gaudium et Spes. His specificity renders the totalizing claims that Christians have made on his behalf exclusionary. He is male. He is culturally and religiously particular. And in this case, his particularity, rather than mediating, mediating the concrete analogy of being, it blinds us to it. John Paul II echoed Gaudium et Spes 1 to 4 when he wrote in the first line of his first encyclical, the redeemer of humanity, Jesus Christ, is the center of the universe and of history. For de Lubac, the genuine renewal of the church sought by the council and inspired in significant measure by the work of ressourcement theologians is impossible without this affirmation. In addition to the witness of Christian love, a lesser way of keeping the world awake to God in the present time is by giving an account of holiness in the world. How are the claims for part one of Gaudium et Spes, how are the claims for Christ part one of Gaudium et Spes makes consistent with the affirmation of life in the world in part two? Dulubach addresses these issues in a 1968 commentary on Gaudium et Spes entitled The Total Meaning of Man in the World, translated by Dave. Um, I don't know if I have time to read this part. Maybe I'll just, it's pretty interesting, but. <laughs> no, it's, it's him, it's not me. It's just, it's, just, it's just my summary. All right, if you insist. <laughs> okay, insisting that part two cannot simply be a practical application of part one, he finds the key to their complex relation in the phrase vocatio hominis from the title that introduces part one. The human calling, both divine and human, a dual vocation with mixed aspects that are in solidarity with one another, means that there can be no fully human solutions to the urgent problems of part two without the Christ-centered theological anthropology of part one. The very fact that the Constitution has a part two signals the Council's rejection of a dualistic theology in which the Church would have nothing to say to us about the things of this world because the guidance of these things would have no light to receive from the Gospel. In shining the light of Christ on the question of human meaning, the Council wants to locate the ultimate reason for human activity in the Christian vocation. The Church is to be both witness and agent of fundamental meaning for both believers and non-believers. And so, the Lubach finally asks, why should eternal life 
have an interest in the building up of this world. Gaudium et Spes could have treated the relation between parts one and two in terms of justice and charity, or even in terms of the mandate of Genesis 128 to fill the earth and subject it. But de Lubach concludes the church goes further, constantly presupposing a certain relationship between human and earthly goods and the ultimate supernatural end to which human being is called in the mystery of Christ. The council, he thinks, takes for granted the idea of a certain future progress of humanity, a progress that is related somehow to the supernatural destiny. Quo modo, that's the big thing. De Lubach begins his explanation of this re relationship by unfolding the myriad concrete corollaries of the Thomistic axiom that grace perfects nature. Much, a much abused and a much abused text. But all right, where am I? The order of charity draws from the human order, even as they are incommensurable and the former transfigures the latter. De Lubach now proceeds very cautiously to present what he calls an historicized version of the Thomistic axiom, and this is pretty wild, in which the human consciousness called to be transfigured by grace progresses under the influence of technology. This progress concerns not the life of the individual, but the life of the whole human race. To the extent that this is true, it is the compelling interest of the church and its witness to contribute to this progress, moving toward the vision of humanity re revealed in Christ instead of away from it, and to help human consciousness remain as open as possible to grace and to its supernatural destiny. He is careful to distinguish between such earthly progress and the kingdom of God, he is careful to place the whole configuration of these antithetical and complementary affirmations under the sign of the word of God made flesh, who as perfect man entered into the history of the world, taking up and recapitulating it in himself. He takes note of the intellectual hesitation of the editors themselves, the critiques of Gaudium et Spes as overly optimistic, and the dangers of collapsing the eschatological into the cosmic and historical. But in the end, he is grateful to the council for having forayed into a relatively new field and for leaving it open for further development. He ends with a strong affirmation. Faith teaches that what we hope for presupposes a transfiguration that passes through the cross, and it reminds us how the church is the matrix in which this cosmic rebirth begins to take place. The, the last part is called Concluding reflections on the perils of being Henri de Lubac, or on the perils of being us, or on the perils of thinking that part one and part two have to be intrinsically related. As he concluded, as he concluded this commentary on Gaudium et Spes, de Lubac could not avoid reference to the secularization he saw threatening to invade the consciousness of Christians themselves. He tried to navigate between the worldliness of a humanism that required the denial, the denial of God and what he called a bad secularization of Christians who, in order to be more certain to reach all people, believe that they have to sacrifice the faith, whereas the faith, in fact, contains the only hope for a truly spiritual integration of man in his world. Gaudium et Spes is addressed to all people both believers and unbelievers, especially atheists, and it proposes to elucidate the mystery of humankind. Dulubach draws attention to the complex relations of the dual meaning of vocatio hominis. He sets out to help non-believers to discern in themselves the natural desire for God inscribed on their hearts. This was the spirit in which Blondel undertook his philosophical studies. It is the spirit of the restless heart of St. Augustine's confessions. But as de Lubac points out, this desire always remains something ambiguous, so that it is not possible to interpret it correctly except in the light of faith. As with the restless heart and the willing will, the story should end with conversion for the non-believer but also for the Christian. If it does not, 
Christians such as Delubach and us are left in the position, vulnerable to charges of arrogant condescension, of seeming to know that most people really don't understand the meaning of their lives. I believe that. <laughs> the two poles of the vocatio hominis can appear to be in tension. At such times, clinging mightily to the person of Christ might appear old-fashioned and ineffectual. One might be tempted to collapse Christ and the church along with the Christian vocation they reveal and mediate into the Christian's human vocation. This is what the Lubach saw around him in 1968 and 69. Theologians from Justin Martyr to Karl Rahner and the authors of Nostra Aetate have taken for granted as Christians that most people don't fully understand the meaning of their lives as revealed in Christ. But in a pluralism normed by diversity, even, as, even if this belief is held with requisite humility and praise for the grace of God, such a theological position is often a scandal that works against the goal of shedding Christ's light on the meaning of life. In what he called the ebb and flow of theology, the integration between the human and divine sides of the human vocation fails on one side or the other. Such are the perils of being de Lubach. Both de Lubach and Gaudium et Spes emphasize the importance of the church's witness to the world. De Lubach speaks specifically about the saints and in his own day invoked often Madeleine Delbreu. Americans tend to speak similarly of Dorothy Day, but the witness of most theologians rarely reaches the bar set by these two holy women as well as by the saints of the church. In part three of the drama of atheist humanism, Dulubach treated Dostoevsky extensively, particularly in relation to Nietzsche's critique of Christian compassion as ressentiment. Dorothy Day claimed that, this is the last page, Dorothy Day, Dorothy Day claimed that anyone who had not read Dostoevsky could not understand the Catholic worker. The brothers Karamazov, which, which we read this semester, performs Dulubach's drama of atheist humanism. Dostoevsky answers the Grand Inquisitor's chilling challenge that imitating Jesus is impossible to ordinary people, by his iconic portrayals of authentic Christ-like love. The old monk Zosima sends Alyosha out to become something of a monk of ordinary life, embodying Christ-like love in the world. This novel reads like a literary rendering of Gaudium et Spes. <laughs> what do you know? I'm not ready to abandon theology for literature, but the saints and Dostoevsky give me pause. They counsel modesty and humility and reveal the poverty of theology without authentic witness to Christ of the kind Delubach gave. In the 1980 appendix on the sacrament of the world that I mentioned before, Delubach commented on a 1964 talk in which Skillebakes voiced his hopes for Gaudium et Spes. In this text, Delubach catches Skillebakes in a very telling omission. Skillebakes ended the 1964 talk on what de Lubach criticized as the false note of an incomplete quotation. The glory of the Lord is man who lives. In a footnote, this is great, I love it. In a footnote, de Lubach completes the quotation from St. Irenaeus and he cites it from Source Chrétienne. The glory of the Lord is man who lives, and the life of man is the vision of God. Skillebakes left the last part out. He had man who lives without the life of man as the vision of God. Theologians who want to answer the challenge of Vatican II and keep the world awake to God might take this as a cautionary tale. Thank you. Since I am the world's wimpiest moderator, we only have 15 minutes for questions, but 
I will take the prerogative of asking the first. It's all my fault. Okay. And I have a very simple question for uh, Professor Bucciolati. Uh, we encounter these scenes in the Gospels uh, repeatedly where you know, uh, prostitutes, tax collectors, adulterers, adulteresses, et cetera, et cetera, are, are confronted by Jesus. Or they're confronted by uh, the Pharisees, or, or sometimes the Sadducees. And what's interesting or intriguing is that they, relative, they rarely seem to be afraid in their encounter with Christ. But they're often intimidated or afraid in their encounter with the, with the religious leaders. And so I, I was thinking about that in the light of what you were saying about the biblical vision of holiness. And I was wondering if you might be able to comment on that in the light of what you said about the biblical vision of holiness versus a kind of naturally religious, perhaps, uh, you know, in the negative sense uh, of view of holiness. So how might we account for the fact that, in spite of the fact that obviously Christ is holier than the religious leaders, or at least the gospel church, that certainly seems to be the point. Uh, there doesn't seem to be that same fear you know, of, the, of the negative kind. So how might you account for that in the light of what you said about holiness? Um, thank you. Well, I don't know that I can really account for it. Uh, the, it is a fact that uh, there is a, a great deal of um, empathy that um, Jesus evokes. Um, and um, it comes across uh, from number of people, uh, Zacchaeus or uh, Nicodemus, uh, completely different people who all are at ease with him. Mm -hmm. um, even uh, during his trial, somehow uh, people seem to be absurdly at ease with him. There is no sense of, uh, um, you know, that they have to provoke him or the, it's a natural conversation, mm -hmm. which is to me also an indication of the uh, strong historicity of the account. Mm -hmm. um, so beyond that, I, uh, in terms of holiness, I guess it's just that uh, um, he, uh, he comes across, I mean, his holiness is so in, intrinsic to his person that there is really no <coughs> schizophrenia. Uh, and therefore, people sense the holiness through his uh, uh, personality. In a way, it's what I was saying about matter-of-factness of holiness, uh, and that's uh, perhaps a, a, something that comes across from Jesus. He's matter-of-factly holy. He doesn't have to try to be, and therefore people relate to it. With, it's a genuineness that comes across. Do we have any other questions for either Bill or Giorgio? This is directed to Bill. <laughs> Not at you, Bill, but... Uh. Now, it's a question about Gaudium et Spes, um, which I'm dealing with in my paper tomorrow as well. And, and the question that... Uh, Gaudium et Spes, I think, is, is your eyes so heavily indebted to De Lubach and the drum of atheist humanism and, and the question of who's got the authentic humanism, Christianity or atheism. But I wonder if De Lubach were alive today, if he wouldn't think that perhaps Gaudium et Spes wasn't concerned somewhat with a... a a quaint thing, humanism. Yeah, humanism. I mean, in, in one, you know, in one sense, is not the challenge now. You know, well beyond the question of who proposes the authentic humanism. In other words, if, if you were to say to some atheist, you know, Richard Dawkins type or something, and said, you know, look here, we, we can now see that clearly Christianity is the more profound humanism, and atheism is not humanistic at all. A Dawkins type might say, well, yeah, and your point is. You know, in, in the sense that the human is no longer central. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering in that sense what the implications are in terms of dialogue with this kind of atheism. Because Gaudium et Spes was clearly concerned with dialoguing with modern atheism. So I would like to ask, what, what do, would you say is the sort of state of the, the dialogue right now with, with modern atheism and whether or not humanism is even that much in the equation? That's hypothetical. Um, 
in, in a sense, can you, is this on? In a sense, I agree with you, um, but in another sense, I think that humanism is alive and well in different forms. Like, uh, you know, there's all these people that are in favor of human rights all over the world. Um, on what, you know, on what grounds does one uh, advocate for human rights? And even Dawkins is is a humanist. I mean, I mean, he's he's offended by um, human suffering. So it seems to me that, I mean, though it may take different forms than, say, Camus or Sartre or something like that, De Lubac would be familiar with. It's still there's still something out there. The humanum appears, even if only in its violation. You know, like by torture. Pe you know, people are against torture, genocide. Th these are kind of basic things uh, in which in which the humanum appears. I mean, that's what I would say. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, like, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, do, uh, do Dawkins and others are very good. It's still sort of mouthing certain pieties and, 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 and actually uh, probably being genuinely concerned about things like torture and so on. But Dawkins and others would also be an advocate of a certain scientific point of view that would argue for the absolute plasticity of human nature, the, our ability to biogenetically engineer it and mold it in whatever fashion and functionalize it in whatever way. So in, in some sense, Dawkins just isn't very bright, right? So he doesn't get the internal metaphysical logic of, of, of his own position. And, and he's not even, perhaps I, I should not have brought him up because he's a bad example. There are probably, and, and Michael could probably, Henry could probably speak to this, but there are even sharper examples of people out there in the scientific establishment who are arguing for a radical sort of post-human notion of the plasticity of human nature from a radically atheistic position that is utterly dismissive in its own way of certain humanists. Yeah, they'd be against torture, but they'd also, get, you know, you know, argue for it in a sort of relative, and argue in relative yeah, ways anyway. If, but if they're against torture and genocide and whatever, you know, they're, they're whatever it is. <laughs> that's a foothold for an internal, an internal argument and, you know, an internal critique of them. Um, and it seems like that's what the form that dialogue w would take. Like why, you know, why do you care? If uh, maybe we're just, maybe all these people need to be disposed of. So My question is for Dr. Bucciolati. Um, you mentioned about the call, and of course Abraham was called out of Ur in the Chaldees, which is, I believe, Mesopotamia. And um, it uh, was pointed out to me by a professor of Dravidian studies that the word for village in South India is Ur. Uh, and that India, Hinduism, of course, is the center of uh, polytheism and everything that goes with it. Christianity has been in India uh, since the time of the apostles, since St. Thomas and also St. Bartholomew. There's still some of the descendants of those Christians in uh, the area near Bombay. So uh, I have two questions. One is, um, is polytheism somehow extremely attractive? Christianity has gone in there. Jesus is recognized in a form of syncretism. So is it somehow easier for people uh, to, to be uh, polytheistic? Um, is our culture itself becoming, in a sense, structurally polytheistic? And in the first four centuries, it was martyrdom which was the ultimate witness uh, that really uh, converted people to Christianity. And now that the colonialism has gone from India, um, so there's no protection for Christianity, um, there is a lot of persecution of Christians. So can you comment on the importance of, of that witness and whether it is much easier to be polytheistic? and syncretist. Yeah, thank you. I definitely think it's um, 
easier, especially in the sense that it is predominant. And I argue also that our own culture is not so much atheistic, but polytheistic. Um, if, if we don't think so much of the uh, individual gods and the myths that go with them, but of this, um, um, the way in which one looks at the absolute and one fragments the absolute. Having gods essentially means fragmenting the absolute. And that gives you control over the absolute. That's what I was trying to say before. So it's very much part of our own um, secular issue. But it's not secular, though, because there is a recognition of the absolute. We cannot function without recognizing that we are conditioned by factors that are beyond our control until we control it. So the, the illusion is, it were, from my point of view, of uh, the modern uh, um, worldview is that ultimately we will be able to control. Given enough time, we will be able to know the mind of God, as uh, Hawkins says at the end of his book on the history, brief history of time. So we'll control the absolute by uh, getting hold of, by breaking it down into the fragments. So it's easier in the sense that it's more. Um, suitable to our attempt at splitting uh, things. Um, but it's not easier in the sense that it doesn't really take us very far. Uh, so accepting the absolute as uh, instead uh, the a source of independent agency, as we do, um, is uh, in perhaps in a way maybe it's easier. It's a bit difficult to know what is easier, but there are really two it seems to be the only two ways of looking at the absolute, polytheism and monotheism. I don't think there is Gnosticism or atheism or secularism. I think our society is polytheistic uh, or monotheistic, and that we all tend to be polytheistic too as Christians because we are so imbued with our own culture that uh, you know, we tend to think of providence as a hypercomputer that <laughs> organizes <laughs> things properly. Uh, I mean, it's a tendency in us to to see it uh, according to this uh, mental template that we have. Uh, but India itself, I really don't know anything. But um, I think this perhaps answers your question. Thank you. Let's take one more, at risk of going slightly over, and then uh, the next session's at four. So I'll take one more question, the gentleman uh, in loudly. the top row. Oh, speak loudly. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, let me take another run at Larry Chat's question, as I understand it. Whether if we leave the, the term humanism aside, we, we might see how Larry could be right uh, insofar as Gunningham says, in other council documents, in the Tao Shimane, I think, do seem to be animated by a abiding and deep conviction that the hopes and fears of all the people were met in the council. That is to say that the church, the gospel, is the answer to people's questions and yearnings, even if these are yearnings and questions they can't articulate, they're implicit, but nonetheless, the larger contemporary consciousness sort of leads to the church. And if you think of the question in that way, the question becomes is that quaint. Uh, it seems to me that that's an open question, that whether uh, as a practical matter and not in the providential view of things, people are really asking questions to which Christianity is the answer. I hate to leave it on that dour note, but time is up. <laughs> Be back at four. <laughs> Okay, if uh, we can call this to order, please. Can I? Is this, uh, can you hear now? Okay, then be quiet. Um, so, uh, I'm very, it's a, it's a, a, a genuine pleasure 
to uh, chair this session. Um, and uh, I guess this is the, one of the few sessions that uh, we, we, we don't have any initial apologies that one has not enough time and uh, <laughs> too much written. So um, Father Kupchak will uh, hopefully have time uh, to say um, all that he has written. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to introduce him. He uh, did his doctorate many years ago at the Institute and uh, happened to be uh, uh, during my first two or three years, more or less, at the Institute. And uh, I served on his uh, doctoral committee, and which was uh, a brilliant uh, dissertation. And uh, it's nice to have him uh, back. Uh, he's speaking to us uh, on John Paul II's um, uh, work at the Vatican, Vatican II and Gaudium et Spes. And um, he, quite appropriately, he is currently the director of the Center for Research on the thought of John Paul II at the Pontifical University of John Paul II in Krakow. And uh, he is author in English of Destined for Liberty, The Human Person in the Philosophy of Carol Wojtyla, John Paul II, which was uh, the book which was subsequently published, um, which was originally his dissertation. So uh, join me in welcoming Father Kupchak. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Schindler, for kind introduction. Thank you for the invitation to this uh, session. Actually, I was told to talk for 30 minutes, so I prepared 10 pages. <laughs> of the, but I, can, I can't expand it always. <laughs> um, I would like to um, start with a, a personal uh, note. Uh, when I studied at the Institute, it was still in the Dominican House of Studies across the street. Then it moved to the uh, Theological College. So f I am for the first time in the Institute here on the campus of uh, Catholic University. And certainly, this is a very powerful uh, sign also of change in the understanding of the pontificate of John Paul II, also in terms of the fruitfulness of the Second Vatican Council uh, itself. So I am very happy to be in this wonderful uh, new uh, building. Uh, and uh, certain, uh, s a second uh, note, um, since I came to Washington after a couple years of my absence here, I have a sense of uh, very profound loss uh, uh, walking the streets uh, here. Uh, and this loss uh, is linked to the death of uh, Father Kurt Pritzel, the former dean of the School of Philosophy, a philosopher, Dominican friar, uh, for many of us a very close uh, friend. Uh, in February 21st will be the first anniversary of his death. So therefore, uh, with a loving memory to Kurt, I would like to dedicate this lecture to, uh, to him. Uh, John Paul II's interpretation of the uh, Second Vatican Council. Um, it's curious to speak on the subject that all the professors and students of the John Paul II Institute are the experts of. But, um, uh, let's start with the quote that, uh, that we have already heard uh, uh, today. The Redeemer of man, Jesus Christ, is the center of the universe and of history. Redemptor hominis Jesus Christus est centrum universi et historie. This first sentence of the first encyclical of uh, John Paul II, Redemptor hominis, um, is certainly the Professio Fidei of the new pope elected five, 
uh, year, five months before the publication of this document. But at the same time, it's the crucial text for the interpretation of John Paul II's teaching and many achievements of his whole pontificate. With regard to this presentation, it is worth noting that this sentence is a quotation taken from the Second Vatican Council's document, Pastoral Constitution, Gaudium et Spes, where we read, the church holds, this is number 10, the church holds that in her most benign Lord and Master can be found the key, the focal point and the goal of man as well as all, all of human history. Clavis centrum et finis totius humane historia. Before we unveil the meaning of this Christocentric theology of human history, culture, and anthropology, it is important to start with some preliminary remarks. First, uh, number first, shape by the council. Before John Paul II elaborated his own interpretation of Vaticanum Secundum, it was the council itself that had in many ways shaped and influenced the young bishop from Poland. It was a 42-year-old Wojtyla who appeared at the opening of the first session of the council in the fall of 1962. He had been a priest for 16 years and a bishop for four years. He was one of the youngest bishops at the council. Wojtyla took floor 24 times. He spoke eight times, into, including twice on behalf of the Polish Episcopate. He also submitted 16 written interventions at the Secretariat of the Council. Among the written interventions, three had not been presented. Cardinal Angelo Scona points out, Cardinal Wojtyla belongs to those whose contribution to the Council was unique, rich in quantitative terms and particularly rich on diverse and doctrinal level. There are not many council fathers who speak at the General Assembly so frequently as did the Bishop of Krakow. As we all know, the most important dimension of Wojtyla's contribution to the council consisted in his emph emphasis on Christian anthropology. It was already clear in Wojtyla's first contribution to the council that took place before, long before the council started. In December 1959, in answer to the request by the Ante Preparatory Commission of the Council, the Capitular Vicar of Krakow then sends his response in which he outlines the main topics that the Council should address. George Weigel rightly draws attention to the unique nature of Bishop's Wojtyla response. He's, he writes, Many bishops submitted outlines of etern internal church matters they wanted to discuss. Karol, Bishop Karol Wojtyla sent the commissioners an essay. <laughs> yeah. The work of a thinker, not a canon lawyer. Rather than beginning with what the church needed to do to reform its own house, he adopted a totally different starting point. What, he asked, is the human condition today? What do the men and women of this age expect to hear from the church? This inductive and phenomenological nature of the text of Krakow's philosopher already clearly proclaimed a method which, as we know, after many struggles and discussions, became the method of the council. In the essay sent to enter preparatory commission, Bishop Wojtyla stressed that the key problem in our modern times marked by materialism is a proper understanding of the human person. Therefore, the specific function of the council should be to show the values of Christian personalism and to distinguish it from other contemporary anthropologies marked by individualism or by materialistic economism. So the author of this document emphasizes in his text several basic elements of such a presentation of Christian personalism that, as we know, became really a stable part of Wojtyla and John Paul II's teaching. First, he writes in this essay, the full truth about man is revealed only in the light of faith. That which can only partially be known in the light of reason and completely in the light of divine revelation requires 
distinguish it, distinguish it man as a person from other visible beings of this world because the others are not personal beings. Hence, the Christian faith fully reveals the truth about man as a person. After all, all human personality, he writes, is expressed particularly in the relationship of the human person to a personal God. This is the very height of all religion, especially of the religion based on supernatural revelation. Participation by grace in the divine nature and the inner life of the Holy Trinity, but which we expect perfect union in a blessed vision, or this can be found only among persons. And then, this is with this anthropological background, Wojtyla brings all the other topics that the Council should address. The importance of, pro of proper ecclesiology, the role of laity of the church, the importance of the formation of the clergy, renewal of religious life, and, and, and so on. So the, this personalistic sensibility on which this first essay to the council is based really permeates all the other topics that he deals with. We know that uh, this anthropological emphasis is present in all other conciliar intervention, interventions of Bishop Wojtyla, those concerning the document De Ecclesia, De Libertate Religiosa, and of course, Schema 13th. About Gaudium et Spes, I'll talk more, more in this pa paper later. We know that of special importance was the anthropological emphasis in Wojtyla's interventions during the discussions about the Libertate Religiosa. Wojtyla was one of the church fathers who managed to tear away the text of Dignitate Humane from political deliberations about the proper relation between the church and state, which uh, was the usual theological form of approaching the issue uh, of religious freedom in the former documents of the church to a deep anthropological reflection about the necessary conditions of actus fidei and the relation of human person to own conscience and the truth. As we know, for Karol Wojtyla, the participation in the council has been an experience of growing and uh, maturing. In his book, Crossing the Thresholds of uh, Hope, he writes how he changed places in St. Peter Basilica. As a young bishop, he sat next to the door. Uh, as a, um, and then when he became um, the Metropolitan Archbishop of uh, Krakow, he moved closer to the uh, altar. But it was not only changing the places that corresponded to his new uh, uh, dignity. Again, as uh, George Weigel uh, uh, writes, this was also a growing importance of this uh, young uh, 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 Polish intellectual. He writes, by the end of the council if in 1965, the young bishop who arrived in Rome in 62 as the unknown vicar capitular of Krakow was one of the better known churchmen in the world to his peers, if not to the world press. And he was known not primarily by contrast to the, to the overwhelming personality of his primate, Cardinal Wyszyński, but as men with ideas and a striking personal present in his own right. The council shaped uh, Bishop Wojtyla and Archbishop uh, Wojtyla. Let us point out some of the fundamental uh, influences. Uh, first, it seems that Wojtyla goes to the council as a philosopher without really any prior important publications in theology. He has, as we know, his doctorate in, uh, uh, on St. John of the Cross, but this is all. I think that he leaves the council as a theologian who for four years had been engaged in writing serious theological texts with some of the best theologians in the church and who will shortly publish some important theological books on his own. Secondly, Wojtyla goes to the council as a young bishop without much international experience. Of course, he studied for two years in 
Rome as a young uh, a priest. He met the Universal Church uh, then. However, it was totally, as he says himself, uncomparable to his experience at the council. He comes from the council as a metropolitan bishop, fascinated by and in deep love with the universal, universality or Catholicity of the church that he had encountered at the council. At one of the witnesses of this can be found actually in his poems that he wrote during the council where he uh, with uh, uh, deep devotion talks about those different bishops from different parts of the world that uh, for him not able to travel, of course, in those years in the communist Poland was a very often exotic experience, but very enriching. Third, uh, the council changes Wojtyla intellectual in many ways. For example, as a result of his work on the constitution Gaudium et Spes, I would hold that he adopts Christocentric anthropology into his thinking in a profound and significant way instead of just earlier theological anthropology. In other words, um, Wojtyla knew that the concept of the human person is a theological concept. However, his work on the Gaudium et Spes with uh, people like Pierre Hauptmann, Charles Meller, of course, Deli Bach, and all the bunch of uh, 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 others made him to adopt a very much more radical Christological reading of his uh, anthropology, which is very obvious when we follow his text before the council and after the council. Also, the council helps Wojtyla to interpret theologically his previously held philosophy of the gift in terms of the Trinitarian, ecclesiological, sacramental, and anthropological notion of uh, communio. As we know, the word of communio does not appear in any writings of Karol Wojtyla before the council. Uh, he uses profoundly the philosophy uh, and theology of the gift, however, without mentioning the communio. After the council, as we all know, uh, being experts, all the experts here, Comunio is all over wherever he writes, especially starting with the sources of renewal and in all other writings. Uh, fourth, the council has an immense influence on the theological language of Wojtyla. As one of the Polish uh, theologians points out, Wojtyla interventions in Latin during the council are formulated in a very traditional language of metaphysical Thomistic theology. Actually, we can, it seems to me, sense a tension when we read conciliar intervention of Wojtyla between his theological language and the biblical quotations. The biblical quotation, in a best sense, serve as a interpret, serve as a inspiration and as an illustration of what he has to say. However, it's not a biblical theology in the best sense of the, uh, of the world. The profound biblical character of the final formulations of the council's documents, especially Gaudium et Spes, but all the documents, presented the young phenomenologist with some striking new perspectives that he would come to use fully about 10 years after the council in written meditations on the theology of the body. This kind of biblical theology that he is able to do in the uh, theology of the body, I think is one of the fruits of the, uh, of the council. It's a totally different language that he had been using, for example, still in Love and Responsibility or the other earlier publications. So in this later text, biblical exegesis is deeply harmonized with philosophical, phenomenological anthropology and Thomistic metaphysical theology that he never gave up. Uh, in addition, as we know, all the encyclicals of John Paul II, starting with Redemptor Hominis, have a deeply biblical character. So before Wojtyla started interpreting the council, 
It was the council to which he contributed with all his insight, especially in terms of anthropology, but it was also the council that shaped the, the young thinker in a very profound uh, way. The council was then a formative experience that went into making of Karol Wojtyla. However, on the other hand, we must not forget the unique testimony given by a close friend and collaborator of Wojtyla, Wanda Pultawska, when she wrote in her diary after the date of February 21st, 1968, short after the closing of the council, quote, I am reading the council documents, writes Pultawska, and I can see that all of it was in Karol Wojtyla's book. She, mentioned, she, of course, thinks about love and responsibility. Everything now presented by the council, and now I realized why the council was not really a revelation for me. I knew it all from the book, and it was all prophetic concept of Karol Wojtyla. What was a revelation for me was his concept of love, and I immediately accepted it as my own, therefore, the conciliar writings have nothing new to reveal to me about love because it was already in the book. His thinking was ahead of the council. The council only confirmed his thinking, perhaps uh, thinking, uh, perhaps interpreting this quotation in terms of the implicit, explicit uh, would be a one way to, uh, to understand it. Second point, the Pope and the council gratitude and implementation. John Paul II is clearly aware that Vaticanum Secundum has been the most important event for the Catholic Church in the 20th century. He speaks about the Council always in the most elevating theological terms. He says, New Pentecost, event of the Holy Spirit, uh, and so on. His relation to Vatican II can be expressed in two terms, gratitude and implementation. Of course, we know this famous quotation from his first Urbi and Orbi message the day after election to the papacy, where John Paul II emphasizes that this number one, pro that number one priority of his pontificate would be put the council's teaching into practice and everyday life of the church. He writes, we wish to point out the unceasing importance of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, and we accept the definite duty of assiduously bringing it into effect. Indeed, it's not that Universal Council a kind of milestone, as it were, an event of the utmost importance in the almost 2,000 year history of the church, and consequently in the religious and cultural history of the world. And certainly, those dozens of thousands of pages of teaching of John Paul II can serve us today for authority, authoritative commentary on the conciliar documents and as a reference point for the adequate reading of the council. And of course, one of the possibility of presenting the John Paul II interpretation of uh, the Second Vatican Council would be to follow the method that uh, Francis Cardinal George presented at the first lecture of this conference, where we would take particular documents of John Paul II and relate them. Well, they are very consciously related to all the documents of the Second Vatican Council and show how John Paul II interprets particular topics uh, of the Council. But even with a, a, a little enlarged time, I don't think it's uh, possible to do it uh, here. It's rather a, a semester a long um, a, a course. But of course, the, the idea would be to show how Lumen Gentium was expanded and interpreted in John Paul II ecclesiology. How uh, council teaching on priests uh, was interpreted in Pastores Dabovobis. How the council teaching on the 
a religious life was expanded and interpreted in Redemptionis Domum, Donum et Vita Contecrata, how the Council teaching on laity was interpreted in Christi Fidelis Laici, how the um, uh, 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 decree, uh, uh, conciliar decree on ecumenism, Unitatis Redintegratio, was interpreted in the encyclical Ut Unum Sint, and so on. Perhaps that's a, that's a plan for a next, uh, for a next uh, 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 conference. However, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think you say thank you, but. <laughs> uh, point three, uh, then, distinctive elements of John Paul II's interpretation of the Second Vatican Council. The first characteristic element of John Paul II's interpretation of Vatican II, I would like to call complexio oppositorum. This is a term that I, of course, it's grounded in the history of uh, a Catholic uh, theology. It was used by Nicolas of Cusa as coincidentio oppositorum, and it means that in, the, in talking about God, we, fa we uh, unite and reconcile what seems to be opposite and impos impossible to reconcile. Um, Well-known political philosopher Carl Schmitt actually writes about the uniqueness of Catholicism and the, the idea of Catholicity in the following way. There appears to be no antithesis Roman Catholicism does not embrace. It has long and proudly claimed to be united within itself all forms of state and, of state and government. But this complexio oppositorum also holds sway over everything theological. And the theologian from whom I borrowed this um, notion writes about this specific trait of the Pope's teaching and behavior. He, quote, he presented contrastic concepts together, dialogue and identity, innovation and tradition. After all, Catholics stands for universality or completeness. This is what the latest council was looking for, a theologically mature view of the vision and nature of the church involving a synthetic approach. Therefore, the Pope would no longer stand alone without a college of, of bishops, nor the bishop without the Pope. There will be no scriptures without tradition, nor tradition without the scriptures. No longer the sacraments alone without evangelization, or evangelization without the sacraments and the liturgy. It seems to me that an excellent example of this ability to integrate uh, concepts can be found in John Paul II's Ecclesiology. During the council debate on the schema de Ecclesia, Wojtyla criticized the somehow one-sided emphasis on the idea of the people of God and pointed out prophetically foreseeing some post-conciliar problems in Catholic ecclesiology that this notion is in danger of being interpreted only horizontally and sociologically. Therefore, Wojtyla thought that the people of God should be balanced by the concept of the church as the body of Christ, Corpus Christi. Starting with his analysis at the council in his 1972 book, The Sources of Renewal, Wojtyla began to see the council more and more through the concept of communio, as I mentioned earlier. This, the extraordinary synod of bishops in 1985 13 years after Wojtyla publication of his uh, book on the council, chose the communio as the most adequate interpretation of Vatican II ecclesiology. However, it is worth noting that Wojtyla in his book, The Source of, of Renewal, as, his, as well as his other publications following the council, also likes to use the term people of God. 
He liked this ecclesiological concept for two reasons. First, it stressed the historical dimension of the church as the pilgrim church walking through the centuries toward the final recapitulation and renewal of everything in Christ. Secondly, the concept of the church as the people of God pointed to the fact that the church has emerged in the world that she has to transform and renew. The second characteristic trait of John Paul II's interpretation of Vatican II lies in his Christocentric anthropology that has been mentioned already um, uh, uh, several times. Um, we know that Christocentric anthropology became a distinct element of Vaticanum Secundum teaching, especially because of the structure and content of Gaudium et Spes. The quote from the documents of Vatican II that most frequently appears in John Paul II's writings is, of course, Gaudium et Spes 22. The text, this text is not only a part of the content of the Constitution, but also in the most profound way defines the structure and form of this document. I would hold that's uh, probably not very original, uh, uh, that through this text Wojtyła and later John Paul II reads Gaudium et Spes and correspondingly the whole council. So let me comment on um, uh, uh, Gaudium et Spes 22 and linked it to the uh, John Paul II interpretation uh, of the council, um, it seems to me that in a, somehow it refers also to the questions about the anthropology and the importance of anthropology or, um, yeah, that, that were already posed. Uh, we read in Gaudium Spes 20, 22, the truth is that only in the mystery of the incarnate word Mysterium verbi incarnati, does the mystery of man, mysterium hominis, take on light. For Adam, the first man, primus homo, was a figure of him who was to come, figura futuri, namely Christ the Lord. Christ, the final Adam, novissimus Adam, by the revelation of the mystery of the Father in his love, fully reveals man to himself and makes his supreme calling clear. Often, in the inter interpretation of Gaudium et Spes 22, one concentrates on the anthropological and Christological statement, Christ fully reveals man to himself. This uh, is important for many reasons. In my opinion, the document of the last pontifical that spelled out the consequences of this statement most fully is Ecclesia in uh, Europa. Um, However, we, I would like to take a little different reading of this, uh, of this statement. For, and it seems to me that this is the proper Wojtyla and John Paul II reading of it. For Karol Wojtyla and John Paul II, this statement of Gaudium et Spes 22 is grounded in the comprehensive theology of human history. The word crucial for this, uh, uh, for this quotation, word figura, figure, uh, Greek hotopos, uh, in the statement, Adam the first man was a figure of Christ, appears, it's an extremely important New Testament word, appears in, though it appears not often, appears mainly in a theologically important places in two uh, uh, quotations, in Roman 5, 15, and first letter to Colossians chapter 10. In Roman 5, St. Saint Paul refers to the person of Adam from, Genes from the book of Genesis in order to emphasize the universality of salvation brought by Jesus. As Adam brought death and universal reign of sin as effects of his first transgression, redemption brought by Jesus introduces into human history grace and justification for everyone. This biblical notion hotopos is not just a literary comparison between Christ and Adam. It reveals a certain theological ontology 
uh, crucial for Karol Wojtyła, John Paul II, Christocentric anthropology and his theology of history. One may add, this interpretation, it seems to me, is often missed by the critics of Gaudium et Spes, by those who, who say Gaudium et Spes is a, is a very superficial, uh, superficial document and outdated because it, it accepted this inductive phenomenological reading of the, of the world. The church fathers did not foresee that the world is changing so rapidly. Therefore, the descriptions of atheism, the descriptions of the rise of importance of women, the description of signal temporum, this is already not, I think this is a very superficial and not real reading of Gaudium et Spes, not what the, what the church, uh, um, as we know some important books has been published along criticizing Gaudium et Spes pretty much along these uh, uh, lines. Let's, let us turn to 1 Corinthians 10. In this word, hotopos refers to the relation between the events described in the Old Testament and those that happen in the eschatological reality in which St. Paul writes to the Corinthians. This comparison has first a spiritual character. St. Paul points out the similarity between the experience of Israelites on the desert, their spiritual fight with temptation, their weakness, and the situation of the present addressees of the letter. In this sense, events from the time of Moses may serve as a spiritual examples for uh, Corinthians. However, this spiritual comparison between the Old and the New Testament is grounded in a certain theological ont ont ontology. St. Paul, <coughs> excuse me, St. Paul makes a comparison between Israelites' way through the desert and Christian sacramental order. Foremost, mentioning the sacrament of baptism and the Eucharist, when he writes that Israelites were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. And then he writes this extremely important phrase, they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Certainly, this verse has to be interpreted in the light of the whole Christology of St. Paul, and especially his hymns about the pre-existence of Christ, Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1 which form the primary biblic biblical background, a reference point for Gaudium et Spes. I think this is again very often missed by critics of Gaudium et Spes. The texts, we may check it, but I think the biblical texts that are most frequently quoted in Gaudium et Spes are Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1 and Col Colossians 1, the hymns about the pre-existence of Christ. Let me, let me try to explain how this refers to, to the method and content of uh, Gaudium et Spes. So, St. Paul's statement that it was Christ himself who had accompanied Israelites in the desert is a logical conclusion from letter to Ephesians phrase, for example, in Christ we were chosen before the foundation of the world. In Christ we were blessed with every spiritual blessing. Father in Christ has made the decision referring to the fullness of time to gather all things up in him. So St. Paul's identification of the rock from the times of Israelites' wait through the desert with Christ is a logical consequence of the truth that only Christ is the mediator between God and man, and the Father acts only with his Son and through his Son, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Gaudium et Spes, then, read in the light of Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1, which I think I would like to, uh, it, it's the primary bibli biblical reference for the whole document, presents a powerful and profound theological vision of human history, culture, and anthropology. 
This vision entails a specific relation between creation and redemption, nature and grace. So everything that was created, primus Adam, has been created because of Christ, novissimus Adam, and for Christ, who appears in the human body at the end of time, born of the Virgin Mary. So this Christology from above looks at the human history from the point of view of the mysterious plan, Greek mysterion, Latin sacramentum, conceived by God in his son before the beginning of the time. In such theological vision of Gaudium et Spes 22, where anthropology is part of this interpretation, the created order has only a relative autonomy and independence. Its real purpose is to point toward the completion of everything in Christ, recapitulatio. In this sense, one reads the sentence from Gaudium et Spes 10 with which we started this reflection. Christ is the key, the focal point, and the goal of man as well as of, of the whole human history. Clavis, centrum, and finis, totius humane historia. In a sense, um, the church fathers uh, create, shaping this sentence used really the four, uh, the four Aristotelian causes here, saying that Christ is the effective cause. He makes the human history. He is the formal cause. He is the form of human history, and he is the final cause. He is the uh, end to whom uh, we all um, uh, we all, uh, 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 the whole history tends. So this conciliar statement opens the first encyclical of John Paul II, Redemptor Hominis. In a sense, we have then a vision of the human history and of, of, all, of all creation, of the human culture, uh, of the human science, of the human society, that everything belongs to Christ. There is nothing that does not that has been created not because of Christ, not in Christ. A very profoundly Christo Christological vision, um, where Christ is really the criterion of the true and the good in human uh, history. It seems to me that John Paul II. Um, in his pontificate, adapted precisely this vision of this interpretation of Gaudium et Spes, where I say anthropology, which we very often concentrate ourselves all on, is only part of the, of the picture. It's not just the human person, it's the whole of the universe that has all the causes, all the causes, all the principia, all the arche in Christ the Lord, because he is the, the Lord of uh, history. Of course, there uh, remains, um, even with the, uh, with the kind uh, invitation to expand my time, <laughs> I cannot, uh, uh, I, I, I have to be careful in, <laughs> in taking this. So let me just address some uh, questions that, that, that will have to be answered in order to complete this vision, but they require much more uh, uh, time to be answered. Of course, um, the limited independence and autonomy of the created order, as I said uh, a moment ago, does not violate a certain, out a certain limited autonomy of creation, as well as a possibility of realistic philosophical knowledge about it. Karol Wojtyła, educated in Thomistic realistic metaphysics, always retained elements of this realistic thinking as we witness, especially in his encyclicals, Veritatis Splendor and uh, Fides uh, et Ratio. Uh, limited autonomy does not mean no autonomy, no, real, uh, uh, no, no reality at all, no. Second point should address the question of the philosophical language adopted by John Paul II. 
uh, especially the notions of human rights and human dignity. But there is all kinds of notions that John Paul II very freely accepted. Of course, new feminism was one of them. And as we know, again, very often the criticism against John Paul II Pontifican is exactly pointed toward this point, that he, in a sense, invented or rather introduced into theological church vocabulary notions that are foreign uh, to it, that do, do, not, uh, do not belong, uh, are in danger of um, corrupting the uh, Christian uh, uh, heritage. However, on the one hand, um, let me let me perhaps uh, show the way in which I would answer those questions on the two, uh, on the notion of human dignity. It seems to me that again, if human person for John Paul II is a theological or really Christological notion. So all the concepts relating to the human person can be and should be theologically understood. And the notion of dignity of the human person, I think that for John Paul II, has a theo it's a theological or rather Christological notion because it is only in the light of Christ's redemptive death for the salvation of all that the dignity, the dignity of all human beings become clear. John Paul II celebrated defense of human dignity in his social pronouncements, of course, refers to a modern appreciation of this term. As we know, this modern understanding of human dignity um, I'm not going to expand on that, tends to be um, self-corrupting, tends to be uh, not really saying what the human person is about. The dignity is very often a political notion that is given to some parts of the population, depends on who is interested in using this notion. However, uh, John Paul II uses this, uses this term as a tool for what I would call a preambula fidei, to bring people closer to the full understanding of this theological notion and other theological notions that the church has in own um, uh, theological uh, heritage. So Christ, Christocentric understanding of those notions became a criterion here of what those notions are. Uh, mean. So it would, and I would, I would like to uh, end with, with that. So the human history in which God, the Lord of history, acts in mysterious ways, helps church to enlighten some particular treasures of her theological heritage. The Christian revelation, however, remains an ultimate and corrective point of reference. The hermeneutical circle presented especially in the encyclical Fides et Ratio as a dialogue and exchange between philosophy and theology is possible only under the condition that the whole human history is ruled by the Lord, Kyrios, and that everything that was created really, if the church is the body of Christ. Everything that was created, everything that, that does exist belongs to the church on the basis of the fact of creation and recapitulation of everything in Christ. I think this is the source of John Paul II's openness to the world that was so much celebrated, but at the same time, this was also the source of the attacks that he had to endure because the openness was only openness as so far to those elements that really referred to this Christocentric vision of human uh, history and human culture. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much uh, for the Kupchak. Uh, it was very uh, interesting and helpful. So I'm sure uh, there uh, will be uh, a lot of questions to uh, uh, sort of uh, help you to do what you wouldn't do on your own, which is to expand further. <laughs> so um, I have uh, a question or two myself, but I, I'd rather wait and we'll just uh, see uh, later on. Uh, Professor Healy. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, my, my question is how you might respond to someone who would say, uh, the Second Vatican Council is a pastoral council. Um, that there, there's, no, there's no real dogmatic content. Um, and in, in connection with that, uh, if, if we accept your thesis, which, which, which I, I accept, um, <laughs> um, does, does this uh, Christocentric vision allow us to understand the relationship between dogmatic and pastoral in a new and deeper way? So too far, uh, how do you respond to those who deflect against your strong reading of the substance of the council's teaching by saying it's pastoral, not dogmatic, but then secondly, uh, does does Christocentric a Christocentric vision entail a new a new account of the relationship between uh, dogma and pastoral practice? Um, yes, uh, uh, thank you. It seems to me that um, uh, that the the word uh, pastoral council um, is, is, a, is a technical word that expresses the fact that the council um, did not in a celebrated way pronounce any new theological definitions uh, in, the, in the form canonically uh, approved as did the councils before, issuing condemnations, issuing the, um, the celebrated def uh, different definitions, starting with the earliest. Uh, however, to say, and uh, we certainly can agree with, with this, that the language of this council was, was, was different, but to accept this does not mean that this council has no uh, con dogmatic content. I think that to hold uh, uh, consistently such a view would be absurd uh, in terms of what uh, Cardinal Francis George uh, told us at the first lecture, that in terms of the uh, church ecclesiology, understanding of the ecclesiology, understanding of the nature of the priesthood, nature of the uh, bishop, there were, of course, ecumenism, right? These were theological, not just pastoral changes to the, uh, to the church, how church acts, but, who, but what she is, who she is. So I, I think to hold very consistently such a position, uh, would be really, uh, um, uh, 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 would be self-contradictory. Um, the second uh, question. It, it's more speculative. It's, it's, um, does the relationship between Christology and anthropology enshrined in Gaudium et Spes 22 uh, allow for a, a, a new integration of dogma and, and pastoral service? That's a that's a that's a very that's a very interesting uh, 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 question. Um, it seems to me that my my uh, response to this question um, I would go in the in the direction of again it was already said a few times during this conference that the church. Uh, uh, also, uh, uh, Carl Anderson said this in his uh, uh, in his welcoming uh, uh, address. Um, the church' primary mission is to evangelize. So, in a sense, the Christocentric concentra Christocentric understanding of the church uh, puts back 
all the elements the church has to do, uh, which is to uh, which is to preach the gospel, which is to serve the poor, which is to give glory to God, but the the Christocentric Christ in the center, Lumen Gentium, gives a proper meaning to everything. So in a sense, in this sense, I would say yes, of course. Um, the concentration of Christ, but also, um, and we certainly can see it during this pontificate, that the concentration of Christ on Christ really redefines uh, different areas of church activity in a very profound way, which is uh, the church very often does what she shouldn't be doing, for example, in a certain political activity. So in a sense, the Christocentric uh, orientation makes the church who she is. This would be the direction in which I would, I would go. Thank you. I have a question which began with um, Dr. Portier's talk. And in his talk, he mentioned that Gaudium et Spes mentions two vocations, a Christian vocation and a human vocation. That, that kind of took me by surprise, and it sort of bothered me. And it reminded me of a problem that I've had uh, over the years, which is very specific and silly, which is that I really like pretty dresses. But, but I, I can't understand the connection between beautiful dresses and Jesus. And it bothers me, you know? And so, um, I, and so it's, it's like that. I don't like that there's a Christian vocation and a human vocation. That doesn't seem right to me. And yet it seems to somehow explain the fact that pretty dresses do matter, even if they don't seem specifically to matter um, to my destiny in Christ. And that, see, it seems like I can ask or bring up this problem to you because you talked about um, an, an autonomy of the world, but a limited autonomy. So can you help me? <laughs> yeah, uh, can, you, can you use a different example? <laughs> Yeah, I, um, um, I mean, the first, um, um, the first uh, uh, a, a sentence that comes to my mind that all uh, beauty is really a uh, different name uh, to say uh, for the glory of, to, to use for the, for the glory of God, really, for doxa. I mean, the biblical name for uh, beauty is doxa, right? Uh, it's the beauty of God that appears in the creation in which we all uh, participate. Of course, there is this uh, ongoing debate whether beauty is a transcendental, the Thomistic tradition uh, holds that it is not. In the other theological currents, we rather would have the that, that, that everything this, that is created, every, every being, because it reflects the doxa of the creator, is, uh, is beautiful. Um, this would be the, the, the first point. Uh, your question rather refers a prudent use of beauty, um, uh, um, which um, mm, I would hold that that what I what I said, uh, we we can we can use many examples of that. Um, human flourishing, a natural human flourishing, it's a very basic human fact, right? Uh, we acquire education, we acquire human go goods. This would be a typical language of the natural law tradition, which is health which is education, which is healthy friendships with others, which are the natural goods that we need, sleep and so, uh, right, uh, family bonds, 
independently whether we are Christians, Muslims or not. This is a certain part of the nature and certainly dressing properly would, I understand, belong to this uh, realm. However, uh, from in, in, the, in the theological version I, I, I presented, yes, this is true, that human flourishing is secondary to Christian flourishing, which means that the, that the grace is not, does not only built on nature and supplement nature, but, but transforms nature in the profound way. So natural law, from, from this theological perspective, in a sense is only secondary for the, for the transforming, which means that a Christian, simply speaking Christian, dresses differently than the pagans, right? Christians use beauty, own beauty, and beauty of the clothes in different ways than the pagans, than the pagans would, uh, I don't know, what about Mesopotamians, but uh, <laughs> uh, but I think this would be a this would be a very uh, uh, a very distinct way of natural formation for Christian transformed by grace. Thank you, I, I Professor. I, okay, I would, I would just let this go, but <laughs> but I think it's very important, and it has to do with the central uh, point of, of the paradox that, of the Lubach's paradox, that there aren't two vocations. There's, it's vocatio hominis. That's like I started off by saying that he takes, he begins his reflection from the title of the introduction, which I forget what the first part of it is, but the, the last phrase is de vocatione hominis. And then he says that what makes this complex and variously related is that there's a dual aspect to this. And so the problem is, you know, ordering the dual aspects. So I don't want to, I don't want it to be remembered that I said that there were two vocations <laughs> and that they were in con conflict because this is the whole, that's the peril of being Henri de Lubac and us is that, you know, we need, we, we, we are called to integrate two halves of, of uh, Galleon and Spes, and this is hard, and we tend to err on one side or the other. But then I have a question. Can I ask a question? Um, it's kind of related. Uh, as you were speaking, I, I was thinking that I wanted to ask you about Fides et Ratio, and then you talked about Fides et Ratio. But it seems to me that Fides et Ratio is contested now. Um, and that it pushes justa autonomia and recta autonomia in, you know, the, of reason as far as they can go. And I just wanted to ask you if you could reflect on that any further and if you had any light to shed on that. And, and I, thought, I, I thought your talk was wonderful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, could you... Could you a little bit specify, I mean, uh, ratio, Fides et Ratio is criticized for uh, many reasons. Yeah. And you mentioned this well, criticism. I'm thinking, I'm thinking of, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't want to be real specific, but I'm thinking of the next door neighbors and um, what, what I have called the Thomist resurgence. And, uh, you know, that there are lots of people who don't like Fides et Ratio because of what it says. Um, yeah, yeah uh, you, you put me in a very difficult situation. <laughs> but, it's, but it's related to the Christological center. It's, yeah, it's the yeah. I, um, uh, now, uh, let, me, let me of course start with uh, I, uh, the uh, to give you a, a little bit um, uh, a perspective uh, in Krakow uh, from where I come, uh, Fides et Ratio was also met with a certain philosophical outrage from former uh, students of Karol Wojtyła and some of his younger collaborators. 
but in Krakow, uh, Fidesz at Ratio was met with outrage on a specifically uh, opposite issue because it mentioned Thomas Aquinas as the, uh, as the master of doing philosophy and theology. And basically, uh, the whole generation, the, well, the, the large group of uh, Krakow personalists of phenomenological persuasions were deeply offended by um, this chapter devoted to Thomas uh, Aquinas because, of course, um, the argument was that uh, the whole work of Wojtyła, John Paul II, was in terms of the modern notion of uh, subjectivity. Um, I think this reading of Fides Retratio is false. Uh, this, this reading coming from uh, the group of my Krakow, all the uh, colleagues, is false. Um, it seems to me that um, John Paul II, uh, being very consistent in this from love and responsibility through the acting person up until through Veritatis Splendor up to um, uh, Fides et Ratio, is very consistent in trying to look at the things from two points of view. On the one hand, doing a phenomenological analysis of, um, of human subjectivity, uh, of uh, how do we experience things, and so on. And we know that this analysis brought wonderful effects um, in a sense, inaccessible to a Thomistic tradition, right? Inaccessible. I mean, in Garigou, Lagrange language, the analysis of Karol Wojtyła from, from the acting person is impossible. You cannot simply do it. It's a totally different outlook. However, uh, to say uh, this, and of course I am saying this as a, um, a Thomist, uh, who is, by the way, all the time criticized by my Thomistic colleagues that I am not Thomistic enough, and by my phenomenological colleagues that I am Thomist. So, but uh, that's um, probably John Paul II had the experience, this experience too. However, to say this, that Garigou Lagrange could not write, nor I think understand the acting person, or the theology of the body, the Wednesday Catechesis on theology of the body, is not, it does not mean that this tradition and this style of metaphysical, this metaphysics is outdated or it's not true. Uh, it's limited as, ev as any theological, philosophical and theological method. Uh, however, uh, I would hold that still in terms of the uh, philosoph in terms of the theological heritage of the church is the is the stable reference point to which in our research and our discoveries we still can we can transcend it we can say th some things that are not um, uh, 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 to say in the Garigula Gra uh, Father Garigula Grange uh, language However, it's still a very safe reference point. Uh, 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 and I think when uh, John Paul II says that in um, theology, we always have to go from phenomenon to fundament, he's exact, he exactly thinks about that, that we have to do uh, not just phenomenology, but ontology. And the ontological tradition of the Thomas Aquinas, as well as all the others masters of the church, Bonaventure, uh, Scotus, for different reasons, remains a point of reference. No, I mean, this. I just wanted to, I don't know say a couple of things because I, I think we're, we're here, we're touching on something that uh, is important for, the, for, the, for this conference. Um, you know, the, the sort of the novelty of Vatican II relative to, you know, earlier ways of doing theology and so forth. Um, 
I mean, because it's, it's one thing to say that uh, we can't dispense with metaphysics. Uh, we, we can't, I mean. Um, but, it, but it's another thing to say that uh, Garigou Lagrange or John of St. Thomas uh, are uh, the best representatives of the Catholic metaphysical tradition. Um, so, I mean, that's just th th so. There's a so there's there's sort of a there's there's a question there about um, sort of the best metaphysics, and it's related to another point, which is that um, I mean. If, if Garigou Lagrange can't understand the theology of the body, but the theology of the body is true, then uh, it's, it's not enough just to sort of say that we need both perspectives. Um, th there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a problem, there's a problem there. Um, and I don't know, maybe it, the, the problem could be addressed by thinking about precisely uh, the, the point that you made, I mean, uh, that yes, he's the Lord of history, um, but he's also the Lord of being, and so there's, some, there's, there's got to be some kind of sort of point of unity between sort of the best metaphysics and, and this Christological contemplation of things. Now, I just want to take, I mean, you know, um, I mean, re recent. I mean, in preparing for my own paper, I mean, I read a little bit of John of St. Thomas for, for the first time, and I mean, nobody can deny that there's great intelligence and erudition and even holiness there. So I, I, I don't want to just sort of jump on the, I don't want to do the usual kind of, you know, all these guys were just horrible and so forth. But, um, uh, it, uh, Anyway, you, I, I, I formulated the question already, so. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I mean, this is, um, this is probably the, the main uh, theological question that, um, uh, that we all the time talk about. Um, my, my personal, uh, it, it seems to me that um, um, certainly, <coughs> Second Vatican Council, as we all know, adopted a totally different language than uh, it was in use uh, in all the uh, documenta preparatoria prepared yeah. by the commissions of Cardinal Ottaviani, yeah. which were formulated very much in the neo-scholastic language of Garigou Lagrange uh, school. Um, they were replaced uh, uh, by different documents that used different language. Right. Saying different language, I, 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 I am aware that choosing a certain language means it's not a superficial change. Right. It's, a, it's a very profound change that, again, in a certain language you can say <coughs> things that you can not say in a other language, right? So the biblical language, biblical patristic language of the uh, documents of uh, Vatican II was a very conscious uh, a choice that helped to say um, uh, many things that I talked about uh, today. Yeah. For example, in terms of the biblical uh, theology of uh, uh, Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1, Christ as the rec recapitulation of the whole, uh, of the whole uh, uh, history. <coughs> now, having said that, it does not mean that the, uh, that the large heritage of the Catholic theology can be forgotten, Absolutely. right? As, uh, as uh, Cardinal, George, uh, Cardinal George said in the opening address, the, the, the church has no and better. Unless the church finds a better language to talk about uh, change in the Eucharist during the Holy Mass, yeah. 
she uses Aristotelian language of transubstantiation, right. changing the substance. Right. Perhaps she will find a better language in the future. However, so far, she has just different theological theories, not a better theory, right. so not the better theory than transubstantiation. And I think this is the, this is the um, usefulness and importance of uh, traditional metaphysical right. thinking and greatness of Wojtyla right. was certainly in combining those two schools of thinking together. As actually one of the, my young uh, Thomist friends uh, said to me, we certainly after Wojtyla, after Wojtyla's death and after John Paul II's death, we are in a serious danger of not understanding his pontificate and not understanding his, his thoughts if the two schools of thinking that he combined go again apart. Right. If the phenomenologist became uh, aversive to any metaphysics uh, as they tend to do, and if the Thomists uh, go back just to Garigula Grange, not being able to talk the language of Husserl, Heidegger, and Scheller. Then, if it happens, we are in a serious problem of understanding Fides et Ratio, Veritatis Splendor. So we'll be picking he here and there elements of John, John Paul II's teaching that, that we like, but the comprehensive picture that he created would be gone. May, may I just respond quickly to that? And also, I, I love your paper, too. I should have said that. I, I should have said that at the beginning. I thought it was a phenomenal paper. I mean, apropos the expert. I mean, that was... But, uh, right. I mean, so that that's... That, that's the issue. I mean, although I, I have to confess, I mean, I don't really like phenomenology. I mean, um, uh, and I, I find a lot of that type of language to use that term kind of off-putting, to be perfectly honest. But 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 that's the issue. Is um, this? You use the word combination. I mean, the the point would be uh, thinking about two things. I mean, what, what's the nature of that combination? Uh, you know, because there are different ways of thinking about how different, how two different things can be one or how they're distinct. You know, as, as uh, Professor Schindler often puts out, put, says, you know, it's, it's things hinge on what we mean by the nature of a distinction. But then the other component of that is, is sort of what is, how does this Christocentrism when it's taken to have an ontological significance, how does that Christocentrism bear on this question of the nature of the distinction between these two different ways of thinking? Because it's not just a question of sort of different languages or something. It's really, if you, if you, I mean, if you will permit me to say, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a question of sort of different ways of conceiving what reason is, you know? Um, and uh, so it's really, in a way, the question of what, what does the ontological density of Christocentrism have to do with the way that we understand reason, sort of in general, and then th the way that we understand what the, the, the sort of logos of theology and of theologizing would be. I mean, that's, so I think that, that's, anyway, just a follow-up uh, for Mark. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um um, I think that, that John Paul II is a philosophical realist. Yeah. Which means that he uh, thinks that human reason can, by its own power, uh, get to know nature, certain elements of the nature of the, ra of the reality in the true way, which refers also, of course, to the question about the natural law and beauty that was uh, later. So um, I do not think that um, talking about Christocentric nature of the reality, we are ready to throw out, yeah, yeah. To, to forget the language of the natural law. Yeah. The only thing we can do 
we can, as Fides et Ratio does it, what some of my uh, Thomistic friends don't like, in a certain way relativizes the language of, of, of natural law, reminding that uh, concepts are historical, that concepts are part of the culture, that concept, different concepts change, that, that uh, there is a huge question of the pure philosophy. You know, how, how pure the philosophy uh, can be in terms of just pure reason. So, so, so these are the questions, but I do not think uh, that, the, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, that, I mean, there, there is this whole area of the natural law cognition which the church held from the beginning the natural cognition of God from the creatures, uh, which is again relativized in a sense by a Christocentric right, uh, understanding of God, but it's not abandoned altogether. Absolutely, yeah. it can't be. Yeah, it can't yeah. Be. It's just whether it, whether it's it's affected from within in some way. That's yeah, like that's but that's a that's a different that's a different question, and whether. The Aristotelian, um, uh, yeah, what, again, what Aristotelian norms hide? What, what do they reveal and what do they hide? Right? They reveal and they hide. But this is, it does that not mean that they are not true in terms of disclosing to us the aspects of, uh, 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 the, aspects of the reality. Just on this point? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This and then, and then uh, Professor Bradley. Uh, go ahead and then on this point, and then Professor Bradley and that be the final question. Okay. Uh, Maybe I just would like to maybe suggest something as a way of clarifying this, and then, and then uh, if, if, if I'm off, uh, you can correct me. Uh, but uh, it, it seems to me that if you look at the history of metaphysics, uh, what, what happens with Aquinas, Aquinas' kind of reading of, uh, of, of Aristotle in the light of the doctrine of creation, uh, it seems to me that you don't get a simple uh, eradication of Aristotle, but almost a kind of deepening uh, appreciation for a sense of being, right? So there's this, I guess you could say there's a sense in which Aristotle is better off in Thomas than maybe he was without. I mean, that would, be, that would all have to be argued. Let's just take that as a kind of argument. Um, if that's the case, so, so it's kind of something happens uh, to metaphysics after the introduction of the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. Um, however that happens or whatever. Um, is it not possible to argue that what, what happens at the Second Vatican Council um, is, is a kind of another uh, 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 refining uh, of metaphysics? So that if, if the doctrine of creation is allowed to cast a backward light on being in Thomas, that the doctrine of the Trinity and Christology is allowed to now cast a backward light on Thomas's metaphysics, and if that's the case, then I think then I think what a Adrian is saying. I mean, it, maybe we can have it both ways in the sense that right. um, if, if Jesus Christ is the concrete analogy of being, um, then then there's then, then Thomas doesn't lose anything, but he's got a lot to gain, maybe, unless there's going to be a rigid no to something that, that you know you know what I'm saying. So that, that would just be a proposal that, that I couldn't unpack, but I bet smarter people than me could. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, what, uh, what Augustine did with uh, Neoplatonism, what, uh, uh, what uh, Aquinas did with Aristotle. Uh, uh, I understand this was also one of the points of the first session today, which I'm sorry I, I missed, so I could not refer to uh, the lectures. I understand you're referring to them, so I, I, I cannot comment on, on, on this. But I agree. So I agree with, with your statement. It will have to be proved, right? <laughs> in concreto. It will have to be demonstrated in concreto how Trinitarian interpretation of uh, uh, Vatican II can add anything to Trinitarian theology of Aquinas, right? Or Christology of Aquinas. 
Final, uh, final question, Jerry. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Marla, for a wonderful paper. Um, on the topic of Gottiman Spaz and its affirmation of a limited or rightful autonomy of the secular order, it's a recurring matter for us. And it seems to me that it's become a recurring point of Pope Benedict's still you know, brief or short pontificate, but beginning with his talk to Italian jurists in 2005, and then in France to the cultural leaders and even more recently some other speeches, Benedict returns to the, the concept of a healthy secularity or a positive secularity as a kind of corrective or explanation of how this autonomy is limited. I don't recall that JP, John Paul II used the term healthy secularity, but I, I suspect that he had the concept at work in mind and would offer or did offer the same account of what a healthy secularity would be or is that Benedict offers, which seems to me to be basically to reestablish or remind people that um, you can never hide, you can run but you can't hide from morality. That no matter what your particular discipline or specific undertaking is, economic, scientific, you name it, uh, there is still morality, and that you're never autonomous from morality, which would seem like very taught to splendor, and, and other things that John Paul II said, that you, you can run, but you can't hide from morality. And I wonder if that's enough to say that healthy secularity is healthy by dint of its uh, moral compass. I don't myself see that that's mistaken, but it, it seems a bit thin. And I wonder, perhaps especially if there's a resource in John Paul II's thinking that might fill out this notion of healthy secularity a little bit more than I, at least in my acquaintance with Benedict's writings, have seen Benedict do. Yeah, I, the, the, the only one thing I, I would have to, uh, to I, I can add to this uh, is, of course, uh, the uh, I, I, I don't know whether this is exactly a quote from uh, Vatican II where, or this is um, just, just a commentary, but the, the, the phrase, the church is not expert in everything, right? There are dimensions of uh, human life, starting with, I don't know, building aeroplanes, cars, and many other things that the church in a sense, not direct expert in it. O already in the, in the Cardinals George inaugural lecture, this was referred to the world of politics, right? To the <coughs> politics as the power play, right? The church is not an expert in power play. It, it works on a different level. So in a sense, the church is everything. The whole reality belongs to the, to the church, as I, uh, I think I, I was trying to say in the in the lecture, but on the other hand, it's, it, it, it's not in terms of the direct dominion or direct expertise of a, of a things, which would again, I think, call what you what you what Benedict calls healthy secularity. However, healthy secularity again, I would call I would hold that in our theological vision is is, is much the secularity transformed by grace. Too. So in a sense, there is nothing. The, the secularity is only a place uh, where, um, which has to be gained for Christ, where Christ is present, but not fully present, right? So in a sense, this dynamism of human history in Gaudium et Spes 22 says that there is no secularity, in a sense, as uh, one of the well-known books uh, starts, right? There is one upon a time there was no secular. So I think this is a kind of a, a vision. Okay, well, thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs>